Hi folks, Matthew Lanigan here with BayWire I still see quite a few people signing in, so we'll just give it two, three minutes and we'll be back to start the presentation. Thanks so much. Hi hey folks, Matthew Lanigan here again with Baywa RE. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer here with Baywa. Uh, just want to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy day to spend a bit of time with us in Polar Racking to learn a little bit more about their PRUD ground mount. Uh, continuing education is really important for Baywa internally and it is externally as well. So once again, happy to have you join us. Uh, just to let you know, we will be taking questions and you just put them down in the bottom right corner of the chat box. We'll do the best we can to answer them as we go, otherwise there'll be time at the end. So I would like to introduce uh, today's presenters. We have Michelle Ala, Managing Director with Polar. We have Keith Roy, Construction Manager, and Arash Zadani, uh, PRI Engineering, Director of Engineering. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Vishal. Hey Matt, thank you very much for that intro and thank you everyone for your time today uh, to learn a little bit more about our product here that is in stock at Baywa, which I believe it's in stock at Baywa coast to coast right now, which is, uh, which is really, really exciting for us. Um, so we'll start the presentation real quick by um, just giving you a quick overview of, of polar racking and, and PRI engineering um, and talk a little bit about our product here which is PRUD which is the D is really for distribution so it's for smaller scale ground mount products uh, projects I should say um, and a, review our foundation guide because a big selling feature or a big plus uh, of this product for installers is that it comes with a pre-stamped foundation guide for each one of the provinces that we're working in uh, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end uh, however like i discussed with matt if you have some questions uh, throughout feel free to put them in the in the chat and we'll try to get to them as as fast as we can so uh, so with that, I'll let Arash tell you a little bit about PRI engineering, and then I'll tell you a little bit about Polar, and, and then we'll talk about the product that uh, we're all here to see today. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Vishal. Uh, Arash is Danny, uh, Director of Engineering with PRI Engineering, uh, oversee the day-to-day -day operation here at PRI. Um, PRI is its own uh, consulting engineering firm with a 
pretty extensive um, background and experience in solar racking foundation design. Uh, we've got three licensed PNGs on staff, um, all based here in Canada. Uh, we've completed projects in the solar space in Canada, the United States, and the Caribbean. Um, we've done over two gigawatts of systems design for foundations and obviously and also done quite a bit of foundation construction oversight uh, a lot of people think that the you know the design process with foundation ends with uh, getting your stamp drawing um, in a lot of cases the the more challenging piece is always the execution of it um, we've worked with a variety of racking manufacturers obviously uh, this presentation is specifically as it relates to the polar PRUD system um, which we're very, very, very um, familiar with, but we've also worked with uh, all the other major racking uh, suppliers in North America and have a pretty good understanding of um, all the different nuances with the different systems. And we also have a fully certified in-house concrete and soils lab here at our Lindsay, Ontario location. And uh, we're slowly actually going to be expanding on that, getting into some more complex soils tests and also getting into asphalt testing, but those two items don't have an extensive uh, effect on, on the solar business. So, um, But that's PRI engineering in a nutshell, and I'll turn it back over to you, Vishal. Yeah, thanks, Arash. Uh, so just to tell you guys a little bit about Polar Racking. Uh, we are a Canadian company. We were founded in 2009. Uh, and we have an extensive uh, product portfolio of uh, rooftop and ground mount systems. Um, in-house, we have in-house, you know, geotechnical, structural, mechanical, civil engineering team uh, to be able to design and work on your projects. Um, and uh, we've supplied racking all over Canada, all over the U.S. and the Caribbean. Just around 500 megawatts of uh, ground mount or sorry, installed PV systems uh, across North America with uh, with a huge pipeline of projects uh, to come. So here's our current product portfolio. Uh, PRUD is the product that we're all here to talk about today, which is our distribution ground mount product. So smaller projects, generally under 500 kilowatts, we like to push through PRUD. Uh, PRU is our utility scale ground mount solution. So greater than 500 kilowatts, so PRUD, you know, as as we'll talk in more detail, is it's a very robust system. It's over designed so you can deploy it in you know 90% of you know North America without having to do um, additional engineering. And it's in stock, in stock at Baywa. So if you have a, a you know a project and you're ready to go, you order it from Baywa. However fast Baywa can turn that around for you, you know, in a day or two. Uh, you know, you're you're out there, you're in the field, and you're building uh, PRU, which is our utility scale ground mount. It's more custom. It's for larger sites, um, and we get very very fine on the amount of you know steel that we use and design it specifically for your module and your tilt angle. And and you know we can get you know to to a tighter price point, but then you know you're dealing with longer lead times. Uh, you know for us to custom make that for you. Uh, solar Carports is a product that we introduced two years ago, which has really been one of our hottest products to date. Uh, we have installs now from California all the way to New Jersey uh, and New York, so coast to coast and in Canada. Uh, and we make our own foundation as well. So we make helical piles, we make ground screws, we make uh, we supply driven piles, and we have a really good ballasted option for PRU D or or PRU. Uh, and then we have a, an exciting new product coming, uh, which we will be announcing very soon. Um, this is just a teaser there, um, but yeah, we have we have we have an exciting new product to add to our lineup this year. So stay tuned for for more announcements on that. Uh, so polar racking, you know, again, Canadian business, simple simple solution here. We offer engineering services, install services, project management, but you know, really. Our core is is it's all based on high quality and you know simple to assemble you know products easily deployable. Once you put it up, you're not worried at all, and 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 you're out there building. So, uh, so again, the reason we're all here today is to talk about our distribution small ground mount solution called PRUD. Uh, generally, again, for projects up to 500 kilowatts, 
uh, our pre-designed system, you know, the ones that you'll find that, you know, at Baywa that's, that, uh, that is sitting in their inventory is designed for 50 PSF of snow and 110 mile per hour winds. Uh, and again, it comes to you, you know, with a pre-stamped structural package. Uh, so, you know, for each province, as long, along with the foundation guide, with a pre-stamped foundation uh, for each one of your provinces as well. So once you're buying the kit from, from Baywa, you're just installing. And if you have to submit, you know, building permits or anything like that, chances are you can submit our pre-stamped packages and, and work off of that. So you're not looking at, you should not be looking at any additional engineering costs, uh, you know, above and beyond that as it relates to the structure and the foundation. Now, certain, certain you know, uh, municipalities or jurisdictions might ask you for that and you know at that point we can offer you that service to to stamp it you know um site specific uh but you know the real intent of this product is you know it's it's a product in a box basically you cut you get your engineering you get your product you go out and build and and uh and you go on to your next site so so you know, couple Michelle, of the, just a quick uh, question: Why is it called? They want to know uh, what's why it's called PRU. D. So polar, PR is you know polar racking. U is utility scale, which is what our original fixed ground mount was. What you know, which was really targeted to the utility scale market. And what we did from there is we realized there is this huge market for anywhere from a 10 kilowatt to you know a 300 kilowatt. Or 400 kilowatt ground mount system. Uh, now it's not efficient uh, or cost advantageous to run a uh, custom roll forming line and you know do site specific engineering for these smaller uh, projects. So you know realizing that you know obviously coming to you Matt and saying hey we got you know there's definitely a need here in the market. Let's design something that can be deployed easily everywhere uh, that has all the engineering done up front and that you guys can stock uh, so we just added the d for distribution <laughs> which is where you guys come in and so it's a polar racking utility ground mount distribution rack basically so if if, if that explains that <laughs> we maybe we need to get more creative with our with our naming here or <laughs> Uh, well, so just yeah, jumping back into to the slide about the product itself, uh, you know, extremely fast installation times. Anyone that's installed it can can definitely attest to that. It does come galvanized, uh, all galvanized steel G90. Um, very easy to align with, you know, different types of foundations. Integrated wire management, which you'll see in, you know, the slides coming forward. A 10-year warranty. Um, we have only four posts because it is a dual post rack uh, for 16 modules, uh, which we believe to be, you know, by far, um, by far industry leading. Um, and then it accommodates slopes very, very well. So, you know, up to 10% ground slope east-west, and then it is UL certified for Canada and the US. So, um, for for bonding and grounding. So, you know, once again, it is a kitted rack. It comes in segments of two by eight. You can easily split up the two by eight into a two by four. Um, but, you know, when you buy it, you're basically buying a two by eight uh, section. Uh, and, you know, the way that we ship it to Baywa and the way that you'll get it is, you know, if you order five two by eights, you'll get five skids of, of racking, five boxes of clamps, and then um, you know, a skid of, of uh, the foot brackets. Um, so, so it is, it, it's very compact, it's very easy to ship and it's very easy to, to you know, see what you're getting and, and kind of place it in the field so, so you can put it all together. Uh, it does come with pre-stamped enduring packages for Alberta, BC, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Ontario, Saskatchewan, Yukon and PEI, um, and then we're, I think Inovic is going to get added to this list here soon. Uh, if your province is not on this list, you know, definitely let us know, and uh, and we'll make sure that that we get that added. So, um, East West Perlins, yeah, East West Perlins come pre-punched 
uh, for for all your wire management, uh, you know, and, and drainage holes. Again, you'll see that that in a couple of slides here moving forward. And it is stock. It is in stock in Baywa. Matt, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I think I know you have some out east, uh, and definitely in Alberta, um, and and in Ontario as well. So. Yeah, they should be in all four locations, uh, BC as well. And folks, if if you want to see exactly what's where, our new web shop has been launched, and you can go in and you can see in real time what inventory is sitting where. Perfect. Uh, so, you know what 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 reference uh, material is available for you? You know, if you go on our site, and I think if you go on the Bay West site, you know, you can pull out the the data sheet, the install and manual, stamp top level drawings of the structure itself foundation guide which will help you select uh, which foundation to use for your site which we will review in the presentation today by the way uh, to show you how to use it and then you know hopefully after you you learn that you're, you're off to the races uh, and our warrant and our standard warranty document um, some of the key highlights you know I think I've reviewed a lot of these in, in previous slides but you know the major thing to note here is that it is fixed rack, it's fixed at 30 degrees. Um, there is a kit, it, it is designed for a dual post system, uh, dual posts, you know, with helicals or ground screws or grouted piles. Uh, and then, you know, we can we can work on a ballasted solution, you know, using this existing rack as well. There is a kit that we can sell you to go to single post if that's what you absolutely uh, need to do. Uh, but that'll be above and beyond, you know, what's sitting in Baywa today. Uh, and um, the last point to note is today, you know, the stock that's sitting in Baywa can accommodate modules because it is a portrait orientation. So we can accommodate modules that are 990 millimeters to 112, 1,112 millimeters wide. Um, now we will continue to evolve as, you know, the module universe keeps getting <laughs> larger and larger. Uh, and um, but today, what's sitting, you know, in stock um, is can accommodate module widths, you know, from that size, and I think that that matches up well with with the modules that are sitting in stock at, at Baywa right now as well. So, Michelle, somebody's asking, is there a timeline for engineering for stamp of Nova Scotia? And that it's currently part of the pack. Yeah, actually, Nova Scotia is part of the package. I don't know why it's not on this slide, but it is part of the package already. So, so yeah, the timing is immediate. Um, so, when you get the package, and and uh, you know, this is a little bit about what you're you know you're looking to see now, depending on the width of your module. So, if you're on the lower end, you're basically going to build two two by four tape you know sections um you know on the table you know it, and it, it'll be split in the middle um but if you are looking you know at larger modules then you're just going to basically have like a continuous row of of two by eight so again when you get the install manual you'll look at your your module uh dimensions and then you can you can size uh you know proceed accordingly basically so we have someone else asking, uh, can you provide 50 degree tilt uh, for off grid? But uh, we've standardized on 30 degree for distribution purposes. Uh, it's to drive down the cost and make it most cost effective. My understanding, when you start to get to 50 degree structurally, it kind of becomes a wall. Can you speak to that, Michelle? Yeah. So we are set up with our wind tunnel study to go up to 60 degrees. You know, with with that being said, like we would only entertain those if it was greater than you know 500 kilowatts at this point. So. But yeah, to, in, and to your point exactly, to keep it economical, to keep it easy and readily available, you know, we've standardized on the 30 degrees because it does, you know, work well in, in most of Canada. So, uh, so what are you going to get? Here's a quick, you know, quick overview of what you're going to get, and, and we'll jump into it. But basically, um, you know, you'll you'll get on our dual post design. You have legs. You, you have you have braces. The north south beam. Uh, east west east west beams um, end clamps and mid clamps and then you know you, you'll be supplying your your solar module so some of the key highlights that you know we like to talk about that set us apart from a lot of uh, a lot of the others are our installation tolerances so you'll see in all directions you know up and down you know uh, 
on the north-south beam, on the east-west beam, we have very generous installation tolerances. So, you know, as you're installing, like you don't need to be perfect. Uh, and with some, a lot of other solutions, you do need to be very perfect. So it is a very forgiving, uh, forgiving solution in, in the field from from an adjustability standpoint. Um, here's just you know some quick images of again that you'll find in the install manual on on um, on you know how to how to put it together, how to install, but also like a little bit of flex and play that you have in the field to to be able to adjust. And you know if if anyone has any questions or would like us to talk to it in more detail, you know we, we can obviously do that. So um it is a very clean solution once you uh once you assemble it uh because you know we free punched all these all our east west beams for you to be able to tie up your wires and for uh to allow for water management or water drainage in into the system so you know generally you shouldn't need any other you know wire management devices you know, or or uh you know bracketry or anything like that um to add to the solution it, it, it is all it is all built in um the bonding is done uh through you know our mid clamps and weaves which again are included in the package uh so so you know just important to note the locations on where you need to to add your weaves and uh and again it is certified uh for Canada and the US for uh bonding and grounding so you should be good if there's any any uh, you know, michelle uh, someone yeah. said can we see the the panel clamp detail more um so it is here in this slide i don't know if you can see what i'm circling here or not if it shows up on your screen or not but um so that's your mid clamp so you know if if you're used to doing rooftop you know it's not a whole lot different than you know mid clamp and ed clamp type solution uh it's just again you know the only difference being that it's a steel mid clamp it's a it's a little bit of a beefier clamp and and again you have your weave underneath does that does that show you what you need to see or was is there something else that like specifically that you wanted us to to talk about i think that's good for now okay great uh, so, you know, as I've said a few times here, and it, it honestly it cannot be underestimated or understated, I feel, is that we are giving you a complete solution. So it's not, you're not just, you know, like supplying you steel. You know, we feel very proud of the fact that we're giving you the structural drawing stamps for each location, but we're also giving you a guide and a solution here for you to be able to deal with your foundations because ultimately, uh, you know, we like to think, you know, we, we like to think we have the best product, you know, above ground, but your risk really lies with, you know, making sure that you put the foundation in properly, that you're never going to get another call. And, and, you know, especially dealing in Canada or Northeast US, you know, we have this thing called frost that can be very tricky uh, and very, you know, painful to deal with if, if you're not, you know, doing the right things up front. So, um, you know, we spent a lot of time up front, you know, developing a foundation guide for you to be able to use to make sure that you're not exposing yourself to any additional risk. Um, and, and we will review that here. But but that is part of the package and that's included in, in terms of, you know, what we've given to Baywa to be able to support, uh, you know, their customers and their installers here uh, while, while they go through this. So, you know the rack is extremely important and again you know being a canadian company we're extremely confident we have the best rack for for you know any of the installs that are happening here but you know the foundation is really 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 where your risk is and you're going to want to mitigate that as much as possible and we feel like you know we've given you a solution to to, to be able to do that here so um so you know with that i'll turn it over to arash arash can talk a little bit about you know foundation and 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 the guide that we've provided and and hopefully you know start you off and uh, on uh, on your journey here to being able to you know, put put these projects together so yeah thanks thanks for that uh introduction vishal um you know i, I do want to start by maybe just noting that uh this 
notion or this um, procedure of obviously skipping some pre-investigation work um, it should only be completed if if the, the size of the facility really can't justify doing so. Um, you know, there's always going to be surprises with the underground. And, uh, you know, in fact, you could probably be standing on the ground and uh, depending on where you are in the world or where you are, it, both your feet could be under very different subsurface conditions. Uh, I know that might sound very drastic, but you know things can things can change very quickly within within a feet or a foot. Um, but that being said, uh, we've developed uh, four robust foundation designs, and the guideline we've prepared is has been developed in a standpoint of giving you more than just one option uh it's summarized to some degree what conditions could be encountered that could go wrong and you know what to do in those circumstances so you know this isn't uh this isn't going to give you every single solution that you may need but it should get you to about 95 to 99 percent of of most conditions um so the the racking itself uh governs the actual design of the of the actual post and so what i mean by that is the actual size of the cross section so you know is that going to be a three and a half inch pipe is that going to be a five and a half inch pipe or is that going to be a 12 inch pipe um, never seen a 12 inch pipe in a, in a solar facility but you know just 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 trying to you know say that it's ultimately the rack that will drive the size of the section what's below grade uh, is typically going to be governed by frost uplift in some instances as you work your way further south from from the border between Canada and US you may you may get into some situations where uh you're you're transitioning back to wind uplift is governing your uplift design but in most cases in canadian environments uh with the exception of maybe uh windsor um you're going to be governed by frost uplift can i get the next slide so um for I won't, I won't talk to this too much but for the for the engineers in the room or the or the number of people in the room this just kind of gives you a gauge of the design loads that we're working with and keeping in mind these are kind of worst case design loads um, so that would be worst case snow and wind loads um, as per the the parameters that vishal noted previously i think it was 50 psf and 110 um, miles an hour or kilometers an hour and um, you know this this develops our pile design loads from the racking system. You know a couple big takeaways. You can see with the dual leg system um, on the axial uplift, there's a huge difference between the rear and front post. You know that's primarily uh, primarily just to show you the, the imbalance of the loading. Um, no worries about going back. We're good. Okay. Um, then the the big the real big question um you know comes is does my site kind of fit into the pre-engineered system of the prud with the prud um, we've got this graph on the top right which you've got your snow loads on the y-axis and your wind loads on the x-axis and what we want to be is we want to be below that blue line so you know, just just as an example, um, anybody that's familiar with Alberta probably has heard or know of Pincher Creek. It's one of the most windiest areas in Canada. Um, you know, there's there's no there's no surprise. There's a lot of wind farms in that area. Very very high winds. Uh, winds coming off of the Rockies. So you can see that red dot is just above that blue line, and then. At, um, as an as another example, Edmonton, you know, well below that line. So, you know, what this curve is saying, you would go to the, you'd have to go to the building code and look up your snow load and wind load for the for the specific area. Uh, some some cases, you know, you might be halfway between 
two cities that are in the building code, you know, we typically recommend you go with the higher of the two values to be to be on the conservative side. Or sometimes what you can do is you can reach out to the to the building department and they may suggest, oh yeah, if you know you're between Saskatchewan and Regina or Saskatoon and Regina, use Regina because it's 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 more appropriate if you are here or whatever. Um, but anyways. You need to look up that information in the National Building Code, and that information is available online. I believe it is actually noted in our foundation guide. And you need to determine your snow load and your wind load and line it up with your, your Y and X axis. So, you know, you can see here Edmonton is 1.7 kPa snow load. So if we line up that blue dot with the, with the Y axis on the left, you know, it lines up with 1.7. And then the wind load is 0.45, so our dot ends up where it's shown, which is below the curve. If it's below the curve, that means that the PRUD system works in that region. So Pincher Creek, um, Banff, and Whistler, I believe, are the three areas that come to mind that this system uh, will not work. You know, we do have some solutions in place, but um, you may you may require some some additional engineering. Um, or just some additional verification that your system will or will not work. Uh, predominantly, what's going to end up happening is is you, there's there's just some very minor adjustments that can be made to the rack, which is actually just basically including an additional kit, um, which would be at an additional cost, but it would be at least using all of the exact same parts and just supplementing it to to give um, some more strength to the to the racking system. Can we get the next slide? Okay, so then, um, you know, once you've established if you're, you're okay from a wind and snow standpoint, the next big question is, is, you know, where do you stand from a frost standpoint? So links to access the Climate Atlas, which I'm referencing on this slide here, is in the foundation guide. Once again, you're going to go to this. Uh, you're going to go to this website, and you're going to be looking up your freezing day, freezing degree days. So that you basically select your location, and and you select just like on the picture on the left there, the the freezing degree days, and then you'll get an output like we have on the right here. So um, freezing degree days, kind of in a in a nutshell, is the number of days where you have, um, which are below zero, uh, multiplied. I, I can't, I can't exactly remember what the number is, uh, but you're multiplying it by a factor to get the 1440. Um, so, I mean, what you need to take away from the two images in front of you, Edmonton and Pincher Creek, is, you know, as we would expect, Edmonton is further north, meaning that it's got more days below zero, meaning that it's got a higher freezing degree days than Pincher Creek, which is in the south. So from that, um, we are able to determine uh, in the in the foundation design guide, there's some guidance for design parameters that need to be met based on the foundation you're selecting based on these degree days. And you can look at those tables, establish your requirements. And so that's going to tell you, like, for example, for a micropile, it might, it might say for Pincher Creek where you're falling, but between an 800 and 1000 freezing degree days, uh, you may need a, a three meter deep pile. Whereas in Edmonton, where you're falling between 1200 and 1500, just as an example, um, it, you would need a three and a half meter pile. So basically you need to look up the freeze, freezing degree days on this climate atlas online. You need to go to the, the foundation selection guide that we've prepared for Bewa and Polar, and you would take the number of days and then it would give you the design parameters uh, for the for the different potential foundation types. Uh, so that that gives you your design parameters. Um, if we get the next slide, once you've got your design parameters sorted out, then um, then we know then we know what we're working towards. Um, but then there's a couple other kind of major 
major kind of considerations that we that we want to that we want to look into and and in some cases um you know like if this is for example an agricultural site a very small agricultural system you know nobody better to talk to than the farmer likely you know he probably has dug some holes in the area he can maybe tell you some some information about the subsurface conditions it's never a bad idea maybe to just do before you do order foundations to maybe do a test dig just to see kind of what you're up against um but some some things that you want to consider is you know where's your groundwater table is your groundwater table close to surface if your groundwater table is close to surface you know micro piles become a little bit of a challenge um and we'll, and we'll get into why that is here shortly um there's presence of cobbles and or other subsurface obstructions you know sometimes you can be dealing with a fill site um you know fill of unknown nature has been placed on a site and and there's you know a handful of obstructions like metal or waste or garbage you know that could be something other than a cobble but you know the the point i want to make here is that if you're dealing with a helical pile you know it's very hard to spin a large blade past an obstruction so you know if there's a lot of if you, if you dig a test hole ahead of time and there's a lot of cobbles boulders you probably want to avoid a helical pile if there's if you dig a test pit and there's maybe one or two you know that that could be something that you could potentially work around bedrock very similar to cobbles boulders and other obstructions it's it's another obstruction you know sometimes you can work around cobbles and boulders but you know a helical is not going into bedrock uh micro piles could be a solution there and, and once again we'll maybe talk or in the next slide we'll talk a little bit about what what you could do in these different circumstances but you know the the point you're trying to make is it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to penetrate a driven uh, some sort of pile that's being driven or something that's being screwed into the ground into bedrock and then predominant subsurface soils within the zone of influence of the foundation um, so you always when you're kind of considering the foundation you want to look at uh, an area about three times the diameter of the actual foundation so in a if you're dealing with a helical, it would actually be three times the diameter of the helical blade itself. Um, to be on the safe side, if you kind of, kind of as a rule of thumb, looked at about one meter beyond the foundation as your zone of influence, that would be uh, useful information. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So we talked a little bit about some of the uh, some of the challenges. So. Uh, on this slide, we're kind of saying, you know, where some foundations might be more appropriate than others based on certain challenges. Um, so when you got groundwater present, you want to try to avoid a micropile. So a micropile, for those that maybe aren't familiar with it, is basically you drill a, a hole, um, probably in this case about six to eight inches in diameter, you place your three and a half inch pipe in that hole and then you grout to either the top of the frost line or to top of grade. Anybody that's tried to drill a hole in on a site that's maybe close to water knows what happens when you remove your auger. You know, you drill your hole. As soon as you move your auger, the, the hole collapses on itself. So that's why obviously a micropile would not be recommended in those situations because you will you'll be you'll be fighting the the collapsing repeatedly if if you go that route so in those situations a helical pile probably your 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 preferred option um now if you're dealing with groundwater present and subsurface obstructions you got those cobbles the boulders maybe you got the bedrock maybe you got some some garbage down there you know a ground screw might be a, a more reasonable tool because they have the ability to um to because they don't have as large of a a plate on as the helical pile do you know they have the ability to to go around obstructions a little bit better so you're not having to do that that hole that uh like you are with the micropile 
and then you don't have that large blade. So, you know, sometimes you're having to kind of, you know, combine some of the, it's, it's not uncommon to have more than one of these challenges on a site. So that's why, you know, you kind of got to be thinking about all the different things that potentially could go wrong. Uh, and then finally, you know, as we deal with bedrock, you know, a helical pile will not drive into bedrock. Um, I've had a number of people tell me that it that it could. Um, I've never personally seen it successfully done and would not recommend it by any means. Ground screw, definitely likely a better, more sensible solution for that. Um, if you're not into groundwater, the micropile is also another really good option. The only potential concern with a micropile and bedrock is uh, you won't be able to typically auger through bedrock. You'd have to use a percussion down the hole hammer, which would require an air compressor and is just a much more larger piece of equipment. So that just might not be as readily available. Um, but on the flip side, you can see the, the other yes in that column is beside ground screw and you know with the ground screw this is the same the same thing would have to happen you would need to be pre-drilling as well now if you're pre-drilling uh, so what i mean like basically you're doing a pilot hole because the ground screw is a large wood screw think about it that way that goes into into the ground the the one thing with bedrock um you know the other thing to keep in mind is you know the ground screw might be the better option because if there is water in the hole uh, you'll still be able to have the ground screw bite into the into the bedrock. However, with a micropile, you got to place concrete. And most of you probably know if you've tried to place concrete in water, it doesn't work the best. You need to use some some additives. Sometimes, uh, depending on the volume of water in that hole, you may need to use uh, what they call a tremie placement method, which is basically you're pumping the grout or concrete to the bottom of the hole so that it can push the water out of the hole and it's able to cure properly. Uh, if you place the concrete from the top of the hole as the concrete goes through the water, it's going to it's going to get uh, basically the the chemical composition is is going to get destroyed and it likely will not create a proper bond with your with your steel pipe and your soil or bedrock. So that that that's kind of all for me. Uh, I know that I, you know, downloaded a lot of information about foundations. So if there is any questions, by all means. Uh, yeah, we, we've got a those. few here. Um, Steve's asking. I'm used to using ground mount design software. Uh, do you have that available? Uh, what type of software? Like for the structural design? or like for selection Steve, selection of respond to that we we can look into that um is there are there any corrosion issues with steel clamps and aluminum framed modules you know it's been the industry standard for a long time to use uh steel clamps with with the aluminum modules and you know, the entire racking is made of steel so um you know there hasn't been any widespread issues uh thus far um that, that that's kind of where we're at right now okay wires below that's also one, one of the functions of the bar oh sorry go ahead that's also one of the functions of the bonding weave is to eliminate that as well okay uh Steve's asking, wires below 1.5 meter need either fencing around the system or protection within with less than one centimeter holes. How does that work for the lower panel wires? So yeah, depending on where you are, you might need to put fencing around the system. Um, it is not, yeah, it's not completely enclosed the wires. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, depending on where you, where you are, you might have to take some additional or put fencing or or there's there's something else that you can do as well. Keep what what uh, what have you seen people do? 
Yeah, so the only way I see them do is to make a cage with uh, chicken wire and use the existing east-west beam as a trough. So they'll just put a, a, make a special box to cover the panel box. And then once it's inside the trough, they're uh, just putting a chicken wire across mounted with self-tapping screws into the east-west beam. Okay. Uh, will the system effectively accommodate bifacial modules? So from a size perspective, yes. Uh, you know, a lot of bifacial modules will fit onto the racking. Now, since the rack, you know, on the low edge is, is three meters, you know, off the ground and, and high edge, you know, much higher, you're generally getting a lot of, or you're getting like, you know, 90% plus of the benefit that you would get on, you know, by using a bifacial module. Uh, so yes, for, from a size perspective, yes, the issue is, if we moved the supports to completely uh, not shade any of the module, the back of the module, you would definitely lose uh, in terms of uh, the amount of load, the amount of snow load you could put on your modules and, and maintain your warranty. So you do have the east-west beams running behind the module, but you know, um, again, this is anecdotal feedback based on you know lots of people that have done installations is that you're you're capturing most of the benefit of having, you know, the bifacial, even though you have the east-west beams, you know, right, running behind the module, so. Uh, is the design guide on the website? So I believe it is, but then uh, Baywa also has it um, as well. So if you need it, you can just reach out to your sales rep, but is it, can you confirm it is on? It's the, not our on our yeah sorry it's not on our website map but it's okay. definitely available through you guys and and your uh, your network of, of salespeople so great uh, does the PRUD kits only come in two by eight format for example if I want to install twenty four modules can I use one point five kits and do they splice together do I have to purchase two kits. Um, Yes, they only come in two by eight. That's uh, something we've done to reduce costs and make it easy to handle and such. And yes, you can combine uh, splice uh, half a table onto another table. And do you want to speak more to that, Vishal? Yeah, you wouldn't even have to splice them together. Like you could separate that second two by eight table into a two by four and and just put it as a as a standalone, or or you could splice it together with whatever you'd like. So. Okay, and then the gentleman asking about the design software question, he said for sizing and layout purpose. So Steve, maybe let's take that offline and we can have your, your sales rep uh, talk about the designing of the ground mounts. Yeah, basically, I, I mean, uh, so my like, you know, you have the top levels there, you have your block size, so if you want to put your block size into whatever software you're using to to do your layouts and sizing, then then you know you could you could definitely do that. Okay, great. And I just see one. Have you had any issues with cold welding taking place while installing your systems? We don't do any welding on site uh, during the installs, so okay. maybe he's referring to galling. Yeah, if you're referring to galling, uh, because we use the magnesium uh, coated nuts and bolts, we don't see that. Um, we do have a stainless steel line that does experience that issue, but it's not an issue with the magnesium uh, coated parts. Okay, now one here splitting the rack into two by four. Can we get another support structure to accommodate eight support piles? So on the two by eight, you have basically you have four piles, um, which is which is a great advantage of the system over over um, any other similar type systems out there. Uh, if you go to a two by four, you'll still have uh, four support supports. Great. I think that's it for questions that I see. So. Um, 
uh, and that same gentleman, but to use the other rails. Sammy, uh, we'll we'll have a rep reach out to you, and we can discuss this further offline. Uh, just really want to thank everybody for taking the time to be with us and, and Polar today. Uh, Polar's been a fantastic product and a partner for us. Uh, it's in stock in the four warehouses, Nova Scotia, Ontario, Alberta, British Columbia. Uh, if you'd like to look for availability, just please sign up for our new web shop. Most of you should have that information now. You can go in there, you can see your price, availability, specs, all that, all that good stuff. As mentioned, uh, we also have piles of available for the product. Uh, if you have any additional questions, just please reach out to your sales reps. They're, they're uh, here waiting to help out as best they can. And uh, once again, thanks to Polar and Vishal, Arash and Keith. Uh, really uh, appreciate you taking the time and the support today. Yeah, no, thank you very much for setting that up and we really appreciate uh, working with your team as well, so. Thanks everybody, stay safe out there. Thank you.